Good evening. Can everyone hear me? This is like my class. Nobody verbally or non-verbally does anything, folks. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. Welcome tonight to the Don Neeland Lecture Series. Um, we're delighted that you came out, especially on a drizzly night. Um, but I think it's a testament to the two speakers we have tonight. The first person who I'm going to introduce, who will then introduce um, Coach Neelan, um, who's really going to um, share his wisdom, his experiences here at WVU. But let me first introduce Jeff Hotsettler. Um, Jeff came to WVU as a transfer student, but quickly established himself as a leader including his very first game, I understand it, that he quarterbacked here. He um, caused a little bit of an upset in the state of Oklahoma, as I understand it. Um, but again, the true leader of the 1982 and 1983 Mountaineer football teams, including he passed the Mountaineers to the 1982 Gator Bowl and led the WVU come from behind 20 to 16 victory over Kentucky in the 1983 Hall of Fame Bowl. How many of you remember that? I see the hands going up, excellent. He then left Morgantown and went to the, the state of New York, and I'm gonna say the great state because I'm a, I grew up there. Um, but patience is a virtue, and good things come to good people who wait. And with time, he then became the head um, quarterback for the New York Giants um, and led them to a Super Bowl and a victory at a Super Bowl over what used to be my team, the Buffalo Bills. Um, with that, I don't think I need to really belabor all that, that Jeff and his wife have done within the community um, with their foundation that they've established. But really, he's here to introduce Coach Neelan. So, Jeff. Well, can you hear me? How many were born in 82? That's what I got to find out. All right. I didn't think so. I uh, appreciate you all being here. Um, it's a great opportunity here just to uh, introduce. Uh, he's actually my father-in-law. Uh, when I was uh, uh, your age, I started out at Penn State and I uh, was there on a football scholarship and, and uh, played in six games as a freshman and then started my uh, sophomore year and then things went south and I decided I was going to transfer and ended up transferring to West Virginia and found my wife here. Uh, that was, uh, man, almost, what, 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, we're uh, uh, just happy to take the opportunity here just to introduce coach and uh, just give you a little background uh, about him um, speaking of uh, as, a, as a head coach he's he's uh, I don't know I, I think he's the winningest head coach here I don't know all the stats that he has um, the stats football wise really didn't mean a whole lot to me uh, because I knew him as as uh, my coach and the impact that he had on uh, myself and and the rest of our uh, my teammates um, but there are some stories that uh, you know, starting out when I was transferring, I came down, um, you know, I heard that he was such a great recruiter and everything like that. And so uh, when you're recruited, they, they kind of know things about you and they try to highlight those things. And, and um, uh, I grew up, you know, in a, uh, a farm boy in a, a small town and uh, came down here and coach decided that uh, he said, hey, I'm going to take you out tomorrow morning, get up early, we're heading out. Just be dressed warm because it's kind of cold. And um, I thought, okay, I'll head out. And so I uh, got up the next morning. Coach picks me up, and with him is uh, President Gee. He was the president back then when I was here. Now he's the president again. But uh, he was there, and he wasn't dressed all that different than what he was dressed like now. I mean, he had the bow tie on and all that. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what in the world are we doing? And uh, so we're traveling up uh, this, this mountainside, and we get uh, going, and it's still dark can't see, don't know what we're doing. Uh, I look around and, you know, there's nothing in the truck. Um, you know, I'm trying to think, what, what are we going to do? And Coach finally uh, pulls up to the hot, uh, side of this mountain and we're just getting out and I'm looking around, I don't see anything. And he says, hey, I understand, you know, you're a farm boy and uh, you've probably done some hunting 
and things like that. So I thought I'd bring you out here and we're going to do some hunting. I want to see uh, how competitive you are. And I looked around and said, well, what are we hunting with? And he said, well, we're going skunk hunting. And I think, skunk hunting? I mean, I've never heard of that. And I'm thinking, well, well uh, what do you do? And he said, well, you see that hole right there? He said, the object of it is to take as many deep breaths as you can and stick your head in the hole. Whoever can stick their head in the hole the longest is the winner. So, you know, I thought, whew, I mean, I can beat these two old guys. I mean, President Gee, you know, he's with his bow tie, and he gets up there, and he, yeah, okay, I'll get ready, and takes a couple deep breaths, <sighs> sticks his head in the hole, and five seconds, ten seconds, pops his head out of the hole and says, ooh, wee, I can't stand that anymore. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to set the standard. I said, uh, okay, coach, I'll go next. So I uh, took a couple deep breaths. <sighs> Stuck my head in the hole. Five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. I pop my head out of the hole and I go, ooh wee, I can't stand it anymore. So coach said, man, you rookie, I'll show you how it's done. And he's competitive. He's really competitive. Even at his age now, he's competitive. So he gets up there and he says, this is how it's done, son. And so he takes a couple deep breaths. <sighs> Sticks his head down the hole. Five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. Twenty seconds. Thirty seconds. About fifteen feet down from the hole, the skunk pops his head out and says, Ooh, we I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> so I knew how competitive he was right off the bat. And, uh, you know, when we came down, we were uh, at a hotel. And again... Uh, coach puts me up in the hotel, and he said, if we have any issues, uh, if I have any issues, just call. And so, uh, you know, I'm trying to get, to, get some sleep, and um, all, I, all, I, all I could hear was this, this, um, this little drip, you know, drip, drip, drip. You know, and growing up as a, as a farm boy, you're always used to being able to fix everything. And uh, sometimes, you know, as a farm boy, you're out in the fields, and... You have to make do with what's, well, you have to go to the bathroom, you have to take a leak, you go take a leak. I mean, so uh, I kind of knew how to handle things and that, so I, I got up in the middle of the night and I'm trying to fix this, this drip, 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 you know, and I'm thinking, man, I can't get it done. I, I, I can't stop it. It was driving me crazy. And so uh, uh, I called Coach and I said, hey, Coach, you know, and he, you know, he he's, thinks that I'm this little farm boy and that, and I said, Coach, I got a leak in my sink. And he, just off the bat, just said, well, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> That's a farm boy joke, all right? I normally don't take a leak in the sink. But Coach at the time wanted to say, hey, it's okay. He was a recruiter and trying to get uh, um, uh, guys to come in and take a look at his program, all right? And uh, part of that was first time I came in, he had his uh, a bull ring on. And uh, they had just won the Peach Bowl the year before. And he came in, and I was meeting with him and that, and what I'd heard about him was that he was just a flat-out, um, straight-line guy. I mean, you knew exactly where you stood with him, all right? And so, uh, as a player, that's all you ever wanted. You wanted to know exactly where you stood uh, with your coach. If you weren't good enough or if you weren't doing something right, you wanted to know. You didn't want to have every other excuse. If you were good enough to play, he was going to tell you you were good enough to play. And so... Uh, First time I met him, you know, he comes in and we're talking and he has this bull ring and he takes that bull ring and he smacks me right in the middle of the chest, right on my sternum with that ring. And I mean, it hurt. And I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying not to act like it hurt. But uh, then he looks at me and he said, uh, this is his recruitment speech to me. He said, uh, you're not the best looking guy, but we could really use you here. And I'm thinking, man, that's, that's how he's going to recruit me? That's his recruitment speech? Well, next thing you know, the door opens up and his wife and his daughter walk in. And uh, I saw his daughter and I said, ah, that's the recruitment. And uh, sure enough, uh, Coach was interviewed later about uh, what he thought of some of the recruits that decided to come in. And he, uh, I had heard what he said. He said that uh, I was the kind of guy that you want your daughter to bring home. I said, that's all I needed. Um, I ended up marrying her uh, a year after I got done playing. So. Um, Coach is a, is, a, uh, is a great man. Uh, he's had a huge impact on a lot of players. 
He's been uh, at West Virginia. He was at West Virginia for 20 plus years. Um, and uh, one of the words that I could use best to describe him is impact. All right, impact means to uh, strike forcefully, to uh, make an impression, to leave a mark. And um, as a player, and playing football, football's an impact sport. I mean, it's, uh, that's what it's about, the big hits. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a tough sport, and uh, lots, of, lots of imprints and impressions left on you physically, mentally. Um, and so impact best describes what I think a coach is because uh, he's, he's left an impression, he's left an imprint, he's left a mark on uh, a huge number of student athletes. And uh, not only on the football part of it, but more importantly, um, on the, the life side part of it. Uh, football is a tough Football's a tough sport, but it's a tough sport in more ways than what you think. It's, uh, mentally, it's a tough sport because there's so many ups and downs and things can change in an instant. Um, they can change in an instant and you can be a hero one second to go to the next. And if you put your self-worth and value yourself into the performance that you have out on the field, you're gonna be on a roller coaster and uh, you're never gonna make it. And Coach was one that uh, had an impact on all of us to, to keep an even, even keel, to have a, a great attitude, and uh, to keep close together as a unit, to watch your brothers back. Uh, we had players when I was here, uh, having transferred from Penn State, um, we probably had less than four or five guys on our team that could have cracked Penn State's second team. And... Um, uh, for him to do what he did here at West Virginia with the talent that he had uh, speaks volumes. Because what he did was he took each individual and found um, what he did best, uh, how to motivate them, and how to gel together as a team and get the most out of everybody. And we as players could take that and look, at, look back and see um, how we can try to get the best out of us, to uh, take away those highs and lows and stay even keel and look after our, uh, our teammates' backs. So um, I don't think there's a man as well respected and liked in the state of West Virginia um, as coach, and it's an honor for me to introduce my father-in-law, uh, Coach Neal. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Thank God he was a better quarterback than storyteller. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I don't know about where you came up with some of those, Hosteller, I'll tell you that. The one about hitting him in the chest is true. And you know, the amazing thing about, am I talking too loud? Probably don't even need this daggone thing. But anyhow, I don't think Mary Ann came with Jeff, did she? But when Jeff and his mom and dad are in my office, my phone rings, and it's my daughter. She says, Dad, do you think I could borrow your car? Now, Vicki never called my office and never borrowed my car. And I said, sure, I don't need it for four or five hours. Anyhow, she comes over to get the keys to the car. She walks in the office, and I see her go, boop. And I see Hostetler go, boop. I said, that's not too bad. <laughs> Anyhow, that started it, I'll tell you that. But uh, it's an honor for me, you know, the Don Neal and Lecture Series, we've had some really good coaches, and I was telling Dana, hey, I'm tired of hearing those guys, I want to hear myself, see what I got to say. But uh, so much for that introduction, because when I walked in, some little guy came up to me, and I thought he wanted an autograph. And he said, are you Coach Neal? And I said, yes. He said, I'd like to share my allowance with you. I said, what in the world would you want to share your allowance with me for? He said, my daddy says you're the poorest coach we ever had. So, so much for that introduction. But anyhow, you know, I was a lucky guy. I coached 43 years, and I was always able to stay one step ahead of the so-called whatever you want to call them, because I was able to stay employed for 43 years, and you know, I never ever had to go to work a day in my life. And I grew up in Canton, Ohio. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Canton, Ohio and Stark County, but that's a real hotbed of high school athletics, especially football. And uh, 
So I was no different than any other kid. I wanted to be an athlete. And uh, I grew up playing football, basketball, and baseball. And I was the last of six kids. And uh, two of my sisters never graduated from high school. I got a job. My brother, I don't know what happened to him. He ended up in the Navy before he graduated. So I only had two sisters graduate from high school. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, the basketball coach and the freshman football coach from Bowling Green came to see my dad. And he said, uh, Mr. Nealon, uh, we'd like to offer Don a third of a scholarship for football, a third of a scholarship for basketball, and a third of a scholarship for baseball. When they went out the door, my dad said, I can't, not very smart, but I can add up with those three thirds add up to be you're going to Bowling Green. <laughs> and, and that's how I got to Bowling Green. And when I got to Bowling Green, they were probably the worst football team in America. And I mean, they were really bad. Now at that time, you played on the freshman team, and the varsity had their own team. And uh, uh, the varsity, I, don't, I think they won one game, but my dad came to homecoming. And he's sitting there with me, and we're playing Miami of Ohio, and the score's like 46 to nothing, and it's not halftime yet. He says to me, he says, you know what, Don? He said, you made a great selection coming to Bowling Green. I said, why is that? He says, if you can't play here, boy, you can't play anywhere. <laughs> so they, they were pretty bad. I don't want to tell you about a coach. At the end of that season, Coach Whitaker retired. Coach Whitaker was a good coach, but he, had, he wouldn't recruit anybody. He felt that if you had to recruit a guy, he didn't even want you. Uh, he was past that stage. Well, they hired a guy by the name of Dwight Perry. Dwight Perry was Woody Hayes' offensive football coach. And when he came to Bowling Green, he changed everything, absolutely everything. The impact he had on that team and, and myself and all the other players was unbelievable. And all of a sudden, I wanted to be a football coach because this guy, he looked less like a coach, he acted less like a coach, but man, could he motivate you. His first year, we won seven football games. His second year, he won the Mid-American Conference Championship. And uh, I think the year after I graduated, graduated he won the small college national championship but he was an amazing guy and like Jeff said impact the impact he had on it, all of us was amazing was absolutely amazing he called me in and when I was a senior and he said Don he said uh, I think I can get you a job and I said where's that he said Mansfield Ohio I don't know if any of you know about Mansfield but I go to Mansfield and I interview, and any, anyhow I end up on the sophomore football, sophomore basketball, sophomore baseball, taught four classes of physical education, two classes of geography, and I ran a physical fitness program after I got done with all that. And Mary Ann thought I was crazy because during football season, when, when we finished practice, I ran the weight program for the basketball team. So I'd get home around 8 or 8.30, and I'd take home with me a 16-millimeter projector. We didn't have the video and that stuff at that time. And I'd hang a sheet in the hallway in our little apartment. And I'd always look at Michigan and Ohio State film, because where I grew up, those were the two big teams. And she said, what are you doing? I said, one of these days, I'm going to get a job. And when I do, I'm going to know what I, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be real good. She thought I was crazy, but you know what, the next year I was named the head football coach at Canton South High School. And it was kind of like this one, Dana. I got it because it was no good. Nobody else wanted it, but we turned it around. We turned it around. I left there in four years and went to the University of Cincinnati. Left there in a very short period of time, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And I went back to Canton, Ohio, to the big school, Canton McKinley which at that time was probably the second best high school coaching job in America. You won't believe it, but I had 14 coaches, had a budget of $100,000. I taught health at 8 o'clock in the morning, and that was it. Unbelievable. We averaged 9,000 people to a game. Our game with Maslin, we had 24,000 people there. It was really big-time high school football. It's not like that today, but that's the way it was in 1963 or 64, I'm not sure which. Then I left Camp McKinley, went to Bowling Green as defensive coach. Did those three jobs in a period of two years. Mary Ann said, hell, let's get a covered wagon. 
She said, I haven't unpacked the boxes from the last one. So I go off to Bowling Green as defensive coach. Then I became the head coach, and I was the youngest head coach in America. At the tender age of 31, I was named the head football coach at Bowling Green. And Doit Perry, who was my football coach, was now the athletic director. But he said, Don, I'm not going to release it because it was during the Christmas break. He said, it wouldn't be fair to the students to read it in theirs. I want them to read it in the school newspaper. So my birthday was January 1st, so when it was released, I was 32. So when the students came back, Doit released it. And I was there for nine years, so I was at Bowling Green a total of 12, and then I went to Michigan with Bo. And uh, that was my big break. Bo was special. Uh, he was the kind of guy that uh, when he told his team to go to hell, they looked forward to the trip. That's the best way to describe Bo. He was an unbelievable guy. Terrific guy, terrific coach. Uh, the newspaper painted him as a big bear. He was a teddy bear. When he took those guys in his office, he was something special. But anyhow, I loved Bo. He, he was, uh, had a great, great influence on me. And I might add, when I played at Bowling Green, Bo was an assistant coach here under Doit. So it was Woody and Do Doit and Bo all wrapped up in the one. They all had the same value system. So then I come to West Virginia. And uh, to be honest, Bo said to me, Don, are you crazy? He said, if you win, you'll leave. If you lose, you'll get fired. So he said, what are you going for? He said, what are you going for? He says, hang around Michigan for a couple of years. I'll get you a good job. And I got this job kind of like I got the Canton South job. Nobody wanted it. Because at that time, we were known as one of the 10 worst football teams in America. Four straight losing seasons, no facilities. It was an absolute mess. And uh, that guy right there is a little, uh, you know, he, he didn't tell you the exact truth because had he not transferred here, I probably would only coached here four years because I'd have been with that list of guys that got fired. Because if Jeff doesn't transfer here, we hadn't. Oliver Luck graduated. He was the only quarterback I had. That was my recruiting pitch to Jeff. Hey, Jeff, you can't play here. You can't play anywhere. But we'd had no other quarterbacks. Thank God. And he was a great one. But anyhow, that got us started. But when I took this job, I remember my first meeting with my team. I looked at them. I'm up in front. Hardly any of them even looked at me. I go, oh, oh, they don't like themselves. They don't feel good about themselves. They have no confidence. So I worked, and I worked on nothing but their head. I worked from here up. And we developed our discipline program. We did, developed our value system in the wintertime. And all of you that are going out coaching, I want to tell you a little secret. You make your team in the off season. When that season starts, you really don't have time to do all those little things. But I'm telling you, when you, when you get, the, get them in that weight program or whatever you have them do, hey, when you tell them to put that foot on the line, you put your foot on the line. When I tell you to do this, you do this. When I tell you to jump, you jump. When I tell you we meet at 8 o'clock, you be here at 10 up. And they'll, they get the idea in a hurry. And the ones who can't live up to where you put the bar, then you've got to get rid of them because it's just that simple. Because you, you're going to have a certain bar when you coach, and you're only going to accept whatever you want to accept. You're not going to accept mediocrity. And, uh, I, you know, too many coaches don't tell their team they expect to win. You know, you get what you expect. If you don't expect to win, you're not going to win. But along the journey, there are a lot of things that I found out about coaching, a lot of things that I found out about how to run a program. But the number one thing I found out in a heck of a hurry, the guys that are successful, the guys that last, you know, greatness comes through longevity. And the guys who lasted in this profession, the number one characteristic they had is they were completely honest with their players. They developed a core. The core of coaching is honesty. You know, if your player cannot trust the coach, then you have no chance to win. If the coach can't trust the player, he can't motivate him. You know, I played for Doit. He was completely honest. He was honest unbelievably. Now, you may not like what he had to say to you, but he was honest and he was fair and he won. <clears throat> then my first job was at the University of Cincinnati. My head coach was a coordinator at the San Francisco 49ers as both an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator. He knew more football than anybody I'd ever been around. I mean, he was way out there. 
But you know what? I knew we were going to lose because he told them what they wanted to hear. And with discipline, he just kind of turned his head. And we had guys running here. We had guys running there. And I said to myself, I better get out of here because this ship's going to sink. And I got out of there and went back to high school, and the ship sunk because of his relationship with his players. He never built that trust. And when your players can't trust you, I guarantee you, you're not going to motivate them. I guarantee you. Bob Gibson succeeded Doit. I worked for him at Bowling Green. He won. He was perfectly honest. Then I go to Michigan. I worked for Bo. He was perfectly honest. He won. So when the top guy is honest and everybody trusts him, you got a chance. And hey, Dana, that's true of anywhere. It's true. Hey, if Dr. Gee lies to you or lies to you, I'm telling you right now, we got a problem at the university. It doesn't matter what you do, build a business or anything else, the guy at the top better be a straight shooter. And if he's not, you're going to have a morale problem within the group. Maybe a football team and maybe a bunch of employees. But you better have a straight shooter. Along the lines of attitude, you know, your attitude is 10% what happens and 90% how you perceive it. And you know, all you young guys out there, now I've got news for you. You control your own attitude. If you want to be a jerk, you, it's easy to be a jerk. But it's just as easy to be a nice guy and you make those decisions. I'm going to tell you about three of our football teams. 1988, we had an undefeated football team. I had probably 20 fifth-year seniors, probably 15 fourth-year seniors. Not very highly recruited, but great kids. Absolutely. I could have told them to stand on their head, and they'd have been standing on their head. They believed in me. I believed in them. And we won 11 football games. And to be perfectly honest, I'd have bet my life we'd have beat Notre Dame. Things happened, and I don't want to, because it sounds like an excuse, but in my opinion, we were a better football team. But we did win. In 1993, I had another undefeated football team here, and it was completely different than the 88 team. It was picked fifth in the Big East Conference. It was the first year that we were in the Big East. I think Miami was picked to win it. I think Pitt was picked second, Syracuse third. And uh, I think Virginia Tech fourth, I think us fifth. Anyhow, we go into that season, and the coaches aren't smart enough to know who the quarterback is, which is bad. I had Jake Kelchner, I had Darren Stutzdale. And uh, it bothered me because I really didn't know which guy was the best. So I'd go to bed at night and say, hey, good Lord, tell me which one of those guys is the best. But anyhow, we got through it. First game of the season, we're shaky. Second game, but well, we kept getting better and better. More belief, more confidence. More belief, more confidence. And that team goes undefeated. It was an overachieving team. And to be honest, uh, how in the devil, I don't know. But it was just a great bunch of guys that hung together, believed in what we were trying to do. I suppose we got a break or two along the line, but we had an undefeated season. Now we come to 19. 98, before this season, I'm saying to myself, this is the best football team we have ever had. I got at least six NFL players. I got at least one or two high draft picks. I got a great running back, a great quarterback, experienced offensive line. And I'm got them believing we're going to win the whole ball of wax. Well, we open up with Ohio State. They were picked number one. And they won. They beat us. And they were better than we were. We played hard. But you know what? After that game, I thought I was a dentist. I thought I was a daggone dentist. Because coaching them was like pulling teeth. I don't know if the agents got to them. Uh, some of the juniors started to talk about coming out early. And we won eight football games, but that team should have only lost to Ohio State. And I don't know if we became poor coaches. I became a poor coach. But the attitude of that football team was nothing like the 88 team or the 93 team. And yet it had much better players. 
I think, I think we had seven guys drafted in the NFL. And sometimes that's a curse. It really is because of what the agents can do and get to them. Don't practice hard, don't get hurt, and all that crap. But anyhow, that tells you about attitude. Enough to drive you crazy. The other thing that's so very, very important is you have to have communication with your team or with your employees. They have to understand the role they play on that team. And at the end of every season, I met with my team for half an hour. I met with each player for half an hour. At the end of every spring practice, I met with every one of my players for half an hour. And I had two objectives. Number one, I wanted them to know that I knew everything they were doing academically. And I did, because I had people who gave me all their reports. I had everything about them. And number two, when they left my office, I wanted them to know the role they played and that they were special. That I thought that they were special and we couldn't do without them. I used to tell my coaches, I'd say, hey, when Johnny leaves my office and he calls his mom and dad and says, Dad, Coach Nealon just told me I was special, that I was just as important to this football team as Mark Bolger or Jeff Osteller or whoever. Do you think I could motivate that guy? I guarantee you I could motivate him. Now, I left him know, hey, your big days are Tuesday and Wednesday. Ain't nobody in the stands. Your job's a heck of a lot tougher than Hosteller's. You know, he's a big star and his name's in the paper. It's easy to motivate him. How about that guy that's Pitt's nose guard? That's got to get the crap kicked out on Tuesday and Wednesday. How about that guy that's the defensive tackle for Syracuse? Nobody even knows about him. And I tell him, I say, hey, you're not going to play unless we're 50 points ahead or 50 points behind but you're more important than the guys that are playing because we can't get ready to play without you. And when you get all those guys going in the same direction, you know 100 guys going in one direction, they're hard to stop. And, and I spent an awful lot of time making sure that my team knew the role they played and how important they were to the success of our team. Uh, because motivation is the name of the game. You've got to have them ready to play and get excited the day of the game. The other thing, you need a code of conduct. And you know I get upset. You know, when I, when I first started coaching, I'd go into high schools. And you could hear a pin drop. And the male teachers, they looked like men. They were dressed like Dana. They had a coat on, they had long pants, had a shirt, and most of them had a tie on. And the women looked like women. They had skirts on. They had blouses or whatever they had. And I knew who the teachers were. And you could hear a pin drop. They had discipline in school. When I quit coaching, I'd go in some high schools like a war zone. Huh. I couldn't tell what teacher was who. Some of those 23-year-old teachers, wow. The way they were dressed, I said, good luck. I'm glad I'm not in their class. The guys, flannel shirt and blue jeans, give me a break. And if I was the principal, their asses wouldn't be wearing that. I'm going to tell you that. And I don't swear, but I want you to know, they would have a code of conduct. That's for sure. And while I'm on it, the re you know, I hear about all the money we need to jump, dump into education. We don't need to dump money. We need to get discipline. We need the teachers to be backed by the principal, the principal backed by the superintendent, and the board of education backed to tag on superintendent. And you get this because you cannot teach unless you create an atmosphere for teaching to take place. And if you have no discipline, then you can't get it done. You can't get it done. So you need a code of conduct. My code of conduct, my rules are very simple. I'd look out at my team and I'd say, young lady, most of my guys were men, but I'd say, do what's right. And I'd look at all of them. I'd say, do all of you guys understand what do what's right means? And they'd all kind of look at me. I'd say, is it right to wear a hat in class? Is it right to go to class late? 
Is it right to be downtown at midnight and get drunk? Is it right to be a jerk? I said, well, then we're in pretty good shape. All of you understand what the word right means. The second rule I had was treat other folks just exactly like you want to be treated. I said, do you guys want to be treated like a jerk? No, coach. Well, then you don't treat other people like they're a jerk. And the third one was just give me 100% wherever you are, in English class, down in the weight room, in the practice field, or what have you. Those were my rules. Pretty simple. The more rules you have as a coach, the more problems you have. Our guys knew that there was a frame. They had a lot of movement in that frame. Their hind end jumped outside that frame. Then they had to pay the piper, so to speak. But you have to have a code of conduct. You have to have discipline on your football team. Because if you don't have discipline on your football team or discipline in your classroom or discipline in your insurance company, you got no chance to get it done. Discipline is simple. Do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it. It'd be fun if you did it with a smile on your face, too. Enthusiasm is contagious, but you have to have a code of conduct. I believe that very seriously. I'm starting to forget what I came here to say, Dean. I'm going to have to look at my day going notes, Jeff. And I don't have my classes, so I won't be able to read it anyhow. But there are a couple other things. Oh, yeah, this is the most important. Good coaches good administrators, good anything, make the people around them believe in what they're doing, believe in the program. If you don't believe in what you're trying to accomplish, you're never going to accomplish it. And the most important thing, if you have a team that believes in the coach, believes in the program, believes in the guys next to him, believes in the university, believes in what we're trying to do, you got a great chance to get it done. I want to tell you two, two true stories. Probably getting tired of me telling you stories, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little better storyteller in Austin. I'm going to tell you that. But anyhow, we're playing Boston College. It's Doug Flutie's last year. We had beaten him three times in a row. Jack Bicknell, their coach, was at that time, other than Dick McPherson, my best friend in coaching. And on Friday, his team was out there just screwing around. And he and I sat in the weight room watching. Jack said to me, you know, Don, you've got me three years in a row, but we're going to get you this year. He said, Doug is really, really playing well. I said, well, Jack, I know he's playing real well, but don't count on it. I remember that because he was a great guy. And uh, Doug Flutie was a great player and a great ambassador for football. I'm glad he won the Heisman. So we go in that game, and we come in at halftime, we're down 20 to zip. And I told my team, I said, hey, relax. We're going to beat this outfit. I said, they get two touchdowns, both on broken plays. I said, we left that little turkey get away from us. Our secondary guy breaks down, he flops one about 30 yards down the field, and they run 50 yards for a touchdown. They do that twice on us. I said, they had two drives and couldn't get it in, they kicked two field goals. I said, we're going to shut their hind end down the second half and beat them. So now there's about three minutes, three and a half to go in the game. We had scored twice. We had shut Flutie down. So now the score is 20 to 14. And the ball is, I don't know, give or take a yard or two on either side of the 50. It's fourth down and it's four to go. And that clock's gone, I'm saying. The defense is playing good. Do we punt it or do I? Go for it. If we make it, chances are we're going to win the game. If we don't make it, it's over. So while I'm thinking that, and again, you know, it's only 25 seconds, Tommy Bowman runs up to me, and he jumps right in my face. He said, Coach, Coach, punt it, punt it. He said, I guarantee you, I'll get it. You punt it, and I'll get it. Now that clock mends down to about 10. So I go, punt. 65,000 go, boo. <laughs> you know, everybody wants you to go on fourth down. So man, my guys go in there. My punter gets it up in the air, and I see this Boston College kid waiting to catch it, and I see my man Tommy Bowman. 
And I mean, he's got smoke coming out of both ears. And this is a true story, gang. That kid catches the ball, and as he caught it, he catches Tommy Bone. And that ball went flying. I had me about three Mountaineers jump on it. Four plays later, 21 to 20. He came off and said, what did I tell you, coach? Now, that's belief. He believed that he was going to, he convinced me. Now, Boston College again. This is in 93. Tom Coughlin's their coach. We had just beaten Miami. We had 71,000 people in that daggone stadium. Largest crowd ever. 17 to 14. I remember telling Marianne, we won the game, but we may have lost the war because we had so daggone many kids banged up and we had to play Boston College on Thursday night and they had just beat Notre Dame and they were eight and two. We're 10 and 0, they're eight and two. And we go there and we, to be honest, stink the place up pretty good. We can't move the football a lick, but we always played pretty good defense and they were ahead of us 14 to 10. And we, we had scored our touchdown, there was like four minutes to go, so we kick off to those guys. Excuse me, and I know Tom Coughlin like I knew the back of my hand, and I knew there was no way in God's green earth he's going to throw the football. He's pounding us, pounding us, pounding us. Clock's running and running. I'm saying, well, here goes that undefeated season. So I told Steve Dunlap, I said, Steve, to hell with it. I said, bring Mike Logan off the short side, bring Charles Emanuel off the wide side, pinch everybody else. We call it 50 in fire. I said, if they throw the ball, the honeymoon's over. But if they don't, we got a chance. And I knew he wouldn't throw it. He came out, had the tight end into the boundary, wide slot to the field, and I knew he was going to run off tackle. And he, sure enough, he runs off tackle. My man, Mike Logan, hits him just as he's handing the ball off. Ball flies up in the air. We get it. My guys run over to you. Uh, Kelchner now is injured. This is stud still. He comes up to me. Now, we hadn't gained a yard all day. He says, Coach, don't worry, we're going down to score. I said, well, hurry. <laughs> we only got about two minutes left. I said, hurry. And holy caramony, we go down, and lo and behold, if we don't, we call 81 deep right, we hit Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. What in the devil was his last name? One of you guys got to know that. Anyhow, yeah. what was it? Ed, you got it, Eddie Hill. We hit Eddie Hill going in the end zone, and we end up winning that daggone game and have an undefeated season. And Tom Coughlin came to me after the game and said, I don't believe you, Neil, and I don't believe it. For some reason, we had BC's number, and, uh, and that made us 11 and up. But uh, you talk about belief. There's a bunch of kids. Again, we had, I don't know, 70 yards to go. And we had about two minutes, and we hadn't done anything the whole game. And they said, hey, coach, don't worry, we're going to get it done. And we got it done, and we got it done because they believed they were going to get it done. And that's so very, very important. You know, if you run a business, whatever business you run, the employees that you have with you better believe in your product if you're going to be successful. And it's the job of that guy at the top to make sure everybody in the program believes in what they're doing. But these are things that... Uh, that I found out going along the way. And uh, you know, if you're honest, fair, and consistent with whoever you're in charge of, you have their respect, and you treat them honestly, you can motivate them. And they're gonna give you everything they got. And you young guys are gonna coach, you remember that. You be honest, you be fair, and you be consistent. Now you don't have to treat them alike, because they're not alike. You be fair. And you tell your team, I'm not going to treat you all alike, but I'm going to treat you fair. And if you have that message to your team, I guarantee you, you're going to be successful. And in closing, I want to tell you one more story because coaching can be a little humble. And I was down in Madison, West Virginia. How many have ever been to Madison? Well, those of you who haven't been there, don't be in a hurry to get there. Because <laughs> it's not a great spot. But anyhow, I'm down there. 
and I don't know what year it is, but I'm pumping gas in my car. And this guy comes out of uh, whatever you call those things, and he's got bib overhauls on and a white t shirt underneath it. And he stares at me. And I'm pumping his gas. So I say to myself, I think he knows who I am. So when I got done, he says to me, he says, hey, fella, call me a fella. He says, is that their ring you got on there, one of those Super Bowl things or something? I said, no, that's not a Super Bowl ring. He says, well, what is it? I says, it's a bowl ring. He says, a bowl ring? I said, yeah. I said, you know, if you coach or play and your team has a successful year and you go to a bowl, normally the coaches get a watch and a ring and the players get a watch and a ring. He says, are you a coach or something? <laughs> I said, yes. He says, where are you coach? I said, West Virginia. He said, oh my God. He said, you cherish that ring. You'll never get another one as long as that damn Neyland's there. <laughs> so, so it can be humbling, gang. And uh, I appreciate it. And Dana, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Um, we do have a couple of mics to each side of the room that if anyone would like to ask any questions, if you could come up to the mic so everybody can hear the question. Or if you're buried in a row, just raise your hand and we do have a couple individuals can get to the mics to you. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, okay. It'll make them hard. Excuse me? I did. Who have been some of your inspirational figures uh, or coaches or as I grew up yeah well there any question when I grew up my high school coach uh, I thought he walked on water because you know 14 15 year old kid your coach is something special and he was a guy who was honest and a straight shooter but when I got into the profession Doit coach Perry and the athletic director of Bowling Green who was a disciple of Woody was had a tremendous influence I was an accounting major and he said, what do you, do you like accounting? I don't know. I didn't know. I was an 18-year-old kid. He said, well, Don, I, I think you ought to go into education and coach and teach. I said, I don't know if I'd like to teach. He said, yeah, you would. But anyhow, he had a great influence on me. And then the biggest influence was Bo. Uh, coach Shem Beckler was, uh, I'm telling you, <laughs> you talk about a football coach. I mean to tell you, gang, I'd go home Wednesday night and I'd tell Marianne, I don't think we got anybody left to play. And his philosophy is who's ever left will be good enough. And I want you to know Tuesday and Wednesday was a war. It's not like it is today where you wear shorts and play basketball. I mean, it was a holy war. And uh, that was his philosophy. And I don't mind telling you, boys, I was there three years and we never once were out tough. Nobody was tougher than we were. Those kids would knock your ears off. But Bo was, uh, like I say, he was a teddy bear when he got him one-on-one. -on -one. He, he, he was great with the staff. He was different with the staff. He kept you on edge. He never wanted you to feel real comfortable. Uh, his, uh, I often tried to figure him out. But he kept you on edge because he knew if you were on edge, those guys that played for you, they were going to be on edge. And he wanted his team on edge. But when he said go, I mean to tell you, they went. And uh, I'd like to tell you the story, but I don't want to. I don't want to use the language, but I'll never forget them. Well, go on, give me another question. <laughs> his speech before the Ohio State game, I can't believe it. Anything else?
Thanks, gang. Appreciate it. Is there any other one, Dana? Tell him to tell you. A major? A major? Yes. Oh, he was hard to recruit. Nobody wanted him. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah, nobody recruited him. He lived right next door to Pitt. They never recruited him. We had him in camp. He came down to our camp, and I was walking around, and we were, the kids were playing touch tap. I was watching this kid, and nobody could touch him. And I told my staff, I said, hey, I want that kid. I said, if they can't touch him, how in the devil are they going to tackle him? And, uh, you know, uh, I had a big decision to make, to make. When I recruited Major, I recruited Brownie Nagel. And Brownie Nagel was a great drop back passer. And uh, again, honesty. When I talked to Brownie after spring practice, I said, Brownie, if I were you, I'd leave. Because we're not geared for a drop back passing game. I didn't have seven or eight receivers. We were not fancy pass protection. We were primarily play action pass protection, option pass protection, and we had made a decision that we were going to go with Major. And so I told him, I said, if I were you, I'd leave. And he left and became a number one round draft pick at Louisville. But Major, Major uh, Arizona State offered him a scholarship as a defensive back. But Major had something about him. Great athlete, tremendous pair of legs, and uh, you know, it's a crime he left early. His mother, don't even want to get into it, but he's from a very poor family, lived in the Hill District, and they go on age and said, hey, I'm going to get your son a million dollars. And, you know, at that time, that was an awful lot of money. And I tried to talk her out of it, but she says, oh, you just want him for yourself. I said, hey, I was here before him. I'm going to be here after him. I'm telling you, if he could get a million dollars, I'd kick him out myself. But anyhow, but he came back, got his degree. He's up in Brashear High School. And he's a great kid and a heck of a golfer. If you play him scramble, get him on your team. He'll hit him 300 yards. I guarantee you, he can hit him a mile. Remember that, Ballinger. He may get him on your team. <laughs> He'll make up for your 150-yard drives. <laughs> He'll hit him twice. He can smack him, man. Anything else? I'd like to ask you, uh, how about the keys to your recruiting? The key. Well, I guarantee you when I came here, it was really tough to recruit here. It's not near as tough to recruit here now as it was then, because of what we had. I mean, to be honest, when I first came here, we never took them through the downtown campus till it was dark. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Sunday side was so bad. It was unbelievable. Uh, you know, we didn't have any, you know, I, I remember telling, I forget which president, I said, hey, all you guys do is complain about all these kids drinking. I said, we're a major university and don't even have a recreation center. I said, what, what do you want them to do? I said, give them some options and build a recreation center. I finally got one after they about ready to retire. But it was a tough sell. It was a tough sell. But we only had one daughter. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff said, I only had one daughter. But, uh, you know, John, to be honest, we won early with mid-American players. With mid-American players. And we won because they were highly motivated. And we played a very difficult schedule, every bit as difficult as they play now. And, uh, you know, our fans now don't understand that this job has changed. You know, and this, this is not a reflection of anybody, but when Rich Rodriguez and Billy Stewart had this job, this was the best football job in America. They were almost guaranteed nine wins. And they had the BCS. We had a chance to play for the national championship every year because we were going to win the Big East. I mean, when Boston College, Miami, and Virginia Tech left, I beat those three turkeys. I always won it. They were gone. And, uh, but now, this job's changed. He didn't have nine automatics. You better keep those, who were those couple of Georgia or whatever, and who was that other outfit? Better keep some of those on. Because I want you to know, if we start scheduling Michigan States and Pitts and all these other guys, that's a major mistake. Now, all of you think I'm crazy, but I want you to know, I found out, I remember Doit. Doit taught the football course. He put the term up schedule. 
says, if you want to stay in coaching and you play 10 games, you have a schedule of 10 games. You better have three on there that you are going to win. You better have two or three others on there that you've got a pretty good chance to win. And then you have three or four that you're going to have to scratch and reach for the sky to win. But when you start having eight or nine, that's a tough deal. And if, if outside of our league we start adding teams that are top notch, oh, it sounds great in the paper, we signed Michigan State. Oh, good. Uh, good heck. I want to play Kent State. No, I'm serious. We better find a way to have two or three wins before we go into that league. You take away those three wins we have. Take those three away. Uh, then they're really screaming for Dana. They're screaming now. They have no business screaming. They have no business screaming. Anything else? I'm out of here. Thanks a million.